Hello, I'm Carol Turchick, Director of the Xavier Leadership Center. Welcome to the Take Your Job Search to the X Level presented by General Electric Credit Union and the Xavier Leadership Center. Both organizations share a mission to serve families, individuals, and communities across the greater Cincinnati region. And we're excited to do that through this eight session series to help you learn what works and what doesn't directly from professional career coaches, human resource executives, hiring managers, who work with some of the area's largest employers. For today's session, we ask that you use the chat feature for requested exercise feedback, questions, and comments. Um, feel free to put your questions in there at any time, and we will have a question and answer period at the end as well. Today's session, Negotiation in the Job Search Setting, is led by our partner, Bonnie Curtis. Bonnie is the Chief Human Resources Officer at the Castellini Group of Companies. Bonnie has a long track record of accelerating growth for two very different companies, Procter & Gamble and Castellini. Her experience brings expertise in human resources, management, supply chain, and sales. She's also a PhD candidate for leadership and change. Bonnie, thank you for, thank you for being with us today and sharing your wisdom and expertise. Thank you, Carol, and it is great to be here because this is, I believe, the last session in a series. It and is. This is the icky topic, right? And we're going to kind of get into the ick a little bit because a lot of us don't like to negotiate. Um, what we're going to talk about today is why we should negotiate, what negotiation really is, and then how we do it. And as Carol said, if you have questions throughout, we're going to tag team this a bit. She's going to be watching the screen for the questions may interrupt me if you know a good question comes in on topic for what I'm talking about at that point and and we'll go from there. However, um, as you know and I know we are in the middle of um, hold on. we are in the middle of COVID um, and I would like I'm, I'm sure your life is as stressful as mine right now. So before we start again because this is a little bit of a angst topic, I would like to just take 30 seconds and just relax and get present together. So what I would ask you to do is put your feet flat on the floor, close your eyes. There is absolutely nobody looking at you. I can't see you. I can't see any of you. Put your hands in your lap and take, and I'll close my eyes too, and we're going to take a deep breath together in. And as you're exhaling, try to relax your forehead, your shoulders, and your legs. And exhale out. And then inhale back in. And this time as you exhale, think about your feet and the connection of your feet to the floor and feel the warmth coming up from the floor. One more breath in. And this time when you exhale, try to let all that other stuff go so that you can be fully present here as we talk about negotiating. Great, thank you. Hopefully that helps get us started. So I'm excited to be talking about this with you today and I'm really glad Carol asked me to do it because this has been a very long personal journey for me in negotiating. So I was brought up to be a nice girl and nice girls didn't create any conflict. And we certainly didn't negotiate over anything. And I will tell you the story of when I was in Girl Scouts, we had to sell Girl Scout cookies every year to raise money for something or other. And there was always a minimum number of boxes that each of us were expected to sell. So I definitely wanted to sell my minimum number of boxes. And back then, Girl Scout cookies were 25 cents a box. So it wasn't as expensive as it is now. And I did not want to go selling door to door because to me, that was negotiating. That was stressful. So I would literally use my allowance to buy the minimum number of boxes I had to buy. And then I would have my family eat them. And I did that every single year I was in Girl Scouts. And that is no exaggeration. So that's how far away I was from anything called negotiations. If we had to buy a new car after I got married, I sent my husband in to do the ugly work. Like I'd pick out what car I wanted and then he would go in and do the negotiations because I didn't even want to be in that office with all those salesmen. So that's kind of how I was, honestly, probably till I was 35 years old. And then we moved to China. 
And in China, everything is in negotiation. And it kind of took me two years living in China to figure out this is a game and you got to learn how to play this game. As a matter of fact, what my Chinese friends told me, we ended up living there eight years altogether. But what my Chinese friends told me is if you don't negotiate, you lose face. And you probably know what face means in China. It's your honor. It's your dignity. You are expected to negotiate because this is a game and you need to let me play this game too. So if you're not willing to negotiate, even if I can sell it to you for more money, I didn't have any fun with this exchange and you lose face. And so that took me two years to even figure that out. And then I spent the next six years learning how to play that game. So by the time I got back to the US, I was a completely different person from a negotiating standpoint. Um, to the point that I had a party, I was making guacamole, I walked into Whole Foods, I needed a bag of very ripe avocados, I found one but two of the avocados in the bag were sort of past their sell by date. And I thought I can probably get a discount on these. So I went up to the manager and showed him the bag and said, I want this bag, but two of these are bad. Can I have a discount? He took the bag, looked at it and said, just take them. So I got them for free. So I called my mother and bragged about it. And she goes, okay, you're going way too far. Like you don't go in the grocery store and negotiate. I said, yeah, but it worked. So now I'm the one that goes in for the used car salesman or the new car salesman, and I'm very effective at it. So I personally have made a very long journey to get to the point personally where I'm comfortable negotiating. And then of course, in my job, I'm negotiating all the time as we hire people because I'm doing most of the hiring. So I tell you that story because there is hope for all of us. Even if we hate negotiating, hopefully when this hour is over, you'll be willing to go try it. If you haven't, and if you're doing it already, you'll be better at it. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, when I started my career, I worked for PNG, and I, previous to that, had only ever been a waitress. And as a waitress, you make your money in tips. It's not about your salary. At PNG, they made me a job offer when I started. I was right out of college, and it was more money than my father ever made. And I was like, this is paradise. So I took the offer. And I worked with them for almost 40 years and I got raises and I got promotions. And honestly, it never really dawned on me except one time, which I'll talk about later, to go and ask for anything. Like I got raises at clockwork. We were told not to share our salaries. I never told anybody else what I made. And so I went along really dumb and happy for 40 years with Procter & Gamble. Then I went to work for Castellini in HR. See, I wasn't in HR at PNG. I go to work for Castellini. Now I'm hiring people and I'm on the other end of this. And I learned all kinds of things. Like for instance, when we make a job offer, we hold money back because we expect you to negotiate. And if you do, we can look like good guys and we give you a bit more money. And if you don't, we keep the money, which is a wonderful thing for us. So PNG still does what PNG did. But most companies are like Castellini in that everything's up for grabs and, and you can negotiate your salary when you go in. So that's kind of the first point. If you think that they don't expect you to negotiate, you're dead wrong. So I have four kids that have recently graduated college that are in the job market now. And I told them all, go in and negotiate. Two of them failed. Like the companies they went to work for said, nope, this is all we got. The other two succeeded and got more money by going in right off the bat and negotiating. So it's worth a try. It's worth a try. So here's a couple of sound bites that should tell, oh, let me ask a question before we get into that. Here's my question just to understand who's, who's there. Have you ever negotiated for a job or benefit? So I'll hand it back to Carol to, to run the poll. So yeah, we're getting lots of, so it's about 70% yes and 30% no around there. Okay, perfect. So for those of you that have negotiated, like I said, good for you. And hopefully um, you're going to learn something now to do better. For those of you that haven't, I really hope you come out of this confident um, that you can. Um, so here's the second question. And this one I think goes into chat. Um, let me switch this. Yeah. 
why did you or did you not negotiate and what did you get? I mean, that's probably as, as important as why did you. If you could put in chat, if you did negotiate, what did you get? And if you did not negotiate, why not? So if you could put yeah. that into chat and then we'll talk that a little bit. So one is uh, government employment. So that's pretty set um, with contracts and those types of things. So that, that's understandable. Um, uh, lack of Let's confidence. go back to government employment before we go any further. My husband works for the government. It's, it's all time and grade. I know that. The trick of government employment is get yourself negotiated to a higher grade when you start. And I don't know how to do that. You know, finish your degree so you start as a G whatever instead of a G whatever. Because you'll see in a minute, the higher you start, the better it gets for you your whole career. Yeah. Go ahead. Great. Uh, so um, more salary and a title change is something they negotiated. Uh, extra Great. week of PTO. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, negotiated a separation agreement. Okay. Um, that's a whole different side of this. Good. Yeah. A better salary with a higher 401k match. Um, maternity leave, higher salary. Um, a, a pre COVID to be able to work at home negotiated that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, let's see more salary. Yeah. Pretty much along those lines. So let's talk about the severance agreement because that's an interesting one. And since I've been at Castellini, we've had a couple people come in and ask for that. Like if basically if the company doesn't do well and for some reason you terminate me and I did nothing wrong, you need to pay me this much when I leave. And I think that's what that meant. That's kind of an interesting thing that most of us wouldn't even think about asking. But if you're pretty high up in an organization and you're quitting a job to go in and work there, you want some security that you're gonna get something two of the general managers here negotiated those things one of them we did end up consolidating and we paid out a boatload of money that we never intended to pay out when we signed it but it happened and we had to pay them out so you know if you have any question and i'm not going to talk about this anymore but i just think it's cool that it was brought up if you have any question about the viability of the organization you're going into it's a startup the industry's all shook up they've been consolidating things so far I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing to go in and ask. I need six months salary or four months or whatever you think is reasonable if you end up terminating me short of the next how many years, right? And yeah. I'm sure if you Googled it, you could actually find the boilerplate language that goes with that that you could present to the company. So Bonnie, we, we did have a really good comment when you mentioned that your two children, you know, failed. Um, someone, someone wrote in that... Um, at least the company knew they knew they were worth more. And so Absolutely. They, may not, they may not get it right then, but at some point it will, it may come back. And we're going to talk about that more. My son went into a job asking for 70,000 and they offered him 60 and he went back and said, I need more than 60. And they stuck with 60, but guaranteed him quarterly bonuses, which they have paid out that have taken him back up to 70. So yeah, we'll talk about these other factors besides your salary, but he's one that I would have considered failed. And in reality, he's been at the company a year and a half. He's been paid the 70 now. It just came in in bonuses instead. So yep, that's a great point. That's a great point. Okay, so here's some facts that may help you decide to do it if you're one of the people who hasn't done it. Um, let me get this moving. This thing. First of all, let me describe a negotiation. A negotiation is a dialogue intended to reach a beneficial outcome where there's a conflict. So if you ask your boss, can I have tomorrow afternoon off? And they say, yes, that is not a negotiation because there was no conflict, right? We have to assume whoever's at the other end doesn't want to give you what you want as we go into some of these things. And let me think, let me work with you to think about where negotiations happen because they are everywhere. They're in our lives. And even if we think we're not a negotiator, I'm sure you're negotiating anyway. So within a business, you're negotiating your budget, you're negotiating your head count, you're negotiating your time off. It's happening all the time. And we may not consider it formal negotiations, but the tools are the same. If you're in a nonprofit, I think it's even harder or worse or more of it because you're trying to get people to give you money. So you're negotiating that all the time. Frequently, you're negotiating with a bunch of volunteer people to give you more of their time. And then you're trying to figure out how to dole out the money. So 
um, I think that's more negotiations. Um, you're negotiating at home. Can I borrow the car? Can you do the laundry? All the little things that happen that the other person doesn't want to do it, those are negotiations. Um, countries negotiate, right? So right now in the US, the legislator is trying to negotiate what are we going to do about COVID relief funds? They haven't succeeded. In Europe, you're dealing with Brexit versus the EU. Those are inter-country negotiations. So these go up to a big level. There's hostage negotiations. There's professional hostage negotiators that that's all they do. And actually some of the stuff I'm sharing with you comes from them on how to do this. And that's life or death stuff. So it's happening at all levels all the time. Um, within the job, this is an example that's true. And this is from Dr. Neal at Stanford University. If you and I are starting our jobs, we're out of college or out of high school and we're starting our jobs and you negotiate $7,000 more than I do right now at the beginning, by the end of our career, you will be making 100,000 more than I will per year. So think about that. A $7,000 negotiation now ends up with $100,000 a year later. And that is called compound interest. Albert Einstein was asked, what's the most important invention of the 20th century? And he said it was compound interest. So this is what happens, right? You have 7,000 more to start and you get a 2% raise and I get a 2% raise or whatever it is every year and it just keeps compounding. If for no other reason than this, it's probably worth asking. And even if you're in the middle of your career, ask, because the 401k and a lot of your retirement benefits are based on your salary. So it's more than just the salary, it's all the accruements that go with it, right? So remember this number if you don't remember anything else. If you start at the beginning of your career and get 7,000 more a year, in 40 years, you're gonna be making 100,000 a year more. Here's another few sound bites, and, and this is a book called Lean In that I think is great. If you're a woman and you haven't read it, you must read it. My pitch on a book. If you're a man and you haven't read it and there are women in your life, I would recommend that you read it. So here's some facts. People who ask for a raise is twice as likely to get one as people who don't, and that's a fact. So if you're in an organization and you don't ask, um, there's a really good chance you won't get one. I have a woman, and I'll put my voice down a bit because she sits next to me in the next office, but she came into me yesterday. So I've had her handling all the COVID stuff all year, and she's been phenomenal. And she came in yesterday. We give raises in January, and we were just meeting, and she goes, can I say something else? I said, of course. She said, when race time comes, I'm hoping I get more than 2%, which is kind of what we've been giving everybody. And I said, and I hadn't even thought about this or the raises or any bonus I'm going to give her anything. And I said, absolutely, Donna. And she says, okay, I just wanted to tell you that. Well, who's the front of my radar screen right now? This woman. So as I'm doling out bonuses and raises and everything, I'm going to remember doubly what she did for me this year because she asked. So I would say there's no harm in asking um, because you're, you're more likely to get it. Here's another one that's really interesting. This is when you are in the job um, search. If you make the first offer, your final offer is gonna be 30% higher. So let me use numbers again. And my son with the 60 and 70,000, right? He goes in and asks for 70,000. And he asks for that first. Before they offer him the 60, he asks for the 70. And we'll talk later about how do you get that into the conversation. They come back and say, no, we were planning to pay 60. At that point, he'd already had three or four interviews. They really wanted him. They'd narrowed down to, he knew he was the last candidate left. And now he's asking for 10,000 more than they want to give him. That puts them in a very different situation where, again, they didn't give it to him, but they, they made it up in bonuses, which they probably wouldn't have otherwise. If he, if he had in his mind, I want 70, and they threw out that 60, now 60 is on the table, not 70. If he comes back at 70, they have every right to say, no, that's way higher than we wanted. Let's go to 62, right? So it behooves you to throw that first number out on the table, which is, which is uncomfortable, but that works. And we'll talk later about how to do that. And then the last thing, this is an interesting thing. 
most recruiters say people who negotiate make a better impression. And I think this already came up. If we're willing to say I'm worth this, in their minds, you are worth this. It works. Especially if you're in sales or marketing or any of these jobs where you're going to be negotiating, right? I negotiated hard for the job I have now. And, and my boss will still joke about, yeah, I knew you were going to be no pushover in HR with the way you were negotiating. So if you think about it, if you're willing to negotiate, you can make 100000 more at the end of your career per year. Um, you're more likely to get what you want. And people think better of you, like all the good reasons, right? So then the question is, why don't we negotiate? What are we afraid of happening if we don't negotiate? And Carol, can we throw this in the chat again? Why yeah. would we not negotiate? What are the reasons we wouldn't do that? Uh, conflict, fear of losing the opportunity. Yep. I think that's a common one. Uh, lack of confidence, uh, rejection. Okay, yeah. let's, talk, let's talk about, we'll talk confidence later, but let's talk a couple of those. Fear of losing the opportunity, absolutely. If you go in and say, I want 70,000 and they're thinking about offering you 35, you're not gonna get this job. And the sooner you know that, the better, unless you're willing to accept 35, right? So if you start in so much higher than them, you do have a risk of them saying, we're not gonna be able to make this work. We can already tell. Now, if you desperately want this job and are willing to take it for 35, I think that's where you say, hold on. I think this is gonna be a really good match. I think we can meet some here at How in the Middle here. Let's keep talking. So if they say, we're too far apart and you really want this job, you need to be prepared to say, I'm willing to negotiate down. Let's keep talking because I really want this job and I think I'm the right fit for this company. But if you really want 70 or 65 and they're coming in at 35, the sooner we know that, the better, we're done. Here's the other thing, and I'm sure this came up during the um, interviewing sessions. There's been times when I've interviewed somebody for a job and I realize they want a lot more and I think about their skill set, and I end up offering them a different job where they do make a lot more because I had that opening too, but I wasn't thinking about them for it. So again, how you're positioning yourself in this negotiation helps them to think about you that way. And you may actually end up with a different job within the company. And I've had that happen twice since I've been here and I've only been here three years where we brought somebody in for a position and said, no, wait a minute, we're gonna give them this one. So you're right, absolutely right. There is a risk when you go in and try to negotiate that they're gonna say no. Um, so so that's Bonnie, there, there's a couple more uh, coming up here. So one is um, that you may not be as confident that your skills are tra as transferable. And so you may not feel like it's okay to ask because you, you're not sure about yourself. Exactly. So we're gonna talk that exact subject in a little bit. So hold on on that yeah. one. Good. Good, what else? Um, you don't want to look like you're or man, like you're taking advantage or manipulating. This is the nice person thing. This is how I grew up. You don't do this because it looks like you're trying to take advantage of them. This is business. This isn't family. This is business. And you're trying to make a business arrangement where you can come to work happy every day that you're making enough money for the work you're doing and they feel happy that they're paying you a fair wage. And that has to be the outcome of this, or you're gonna to come to work and you know people where this has happened and it's maybe happened to you. I'm not getting paid enough for this and they walk out, right? So if you take less than you think you're worth, it's not gonna work. You know, even if you're desperate for a job, I would not do that because you are gonna get disgruntled because they're gonna expect a lot from you. And again, if you don't set yourself up for being worth more at the beginning, they're not ever gonna treat you like you're worth more. So again, this is business. And if we don't have an arrangement when we're done, we both move on. And you don't have to like, they're not your next door neighbor, hopefully, and you don't have to see them every morning. So don't worry about it. Um, and I know that's really hard to let go of, but if you're gonna be effective at negotiating what you're worth, somehow you've got to believe that, that this is business and it's just like getting a car. You know, you go to try to get a car and if you don't have enough money, you walk away and say, I can't get that car. 
it's business. And you don't hopefully feel bad that the salesman has wasted his time trying to sell you the car. I mean, that's his job, it's business. So I can't tell you anything more. Hopefully by the time we're done and we talk about some tools and practice and all that, you'll feel a little more confident, but, but that is the gist of it. And that was my problem. Uh, personally, was I always felt that way when I when I thought about negotiating? It's like Ugh, I don't I just don't want to deal with this. But you're you're leaving a lot of stuff on the table when you're not willing to do this. So here's another thought about negotiation. There's two kinds of negotiation. There's fixed pie, and and this has come up already as well. So I'll give you the example. When I've negotiated with a union, I have a budget. So I go in there and say I'm going to give this much money in this contract. And I frankly don't care how I give it. We can give it in salary. We can give it in bonuses. We can give it in pension. I don't care, but here's my budget and that's all I'm giving. The union doesn't know that. A very sophisticated union knows that, but a lot of them don't. So they just keep trying to grab everything they can until I tell them last, best, and final offer, we're done. That's a fixed pie negotiation. There's only so much and we can distribute it however we want. There's another kind of negotiation that I would call win-win. And I'll give you a, a home example of this. Um, it's Friday, your son wants to have a couple of friends over to sleep over and you're tired and you know he's been at school all day and you say no. But we can have those friends over tomorrow night and if you want, I'll take you guys all out for pizza. That's win-win because hopefully he thinks that's a better deal than just having the friends over tonight and you get peace and quiet tonight. So everybody gets what they want out of this. That's honestly where you're trying to go all the time with win-win, but in most cases, when you're negotiating for a job, there's a fixed pie. And then we need to start trading off and we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So your goal is to get a good deal. It's not to get a deal. You can always get a deal if you're willing to back off enough. Your goal is to get a good deal for you. And that's what you've got to remember. This is business and I'm in here to get a good deal for me. So here's some practical advice from professional negotiators. The first question you need to consider is what happens if this doesn't work? And you need to think through that because they may say, we're too far apart, this just isn't gonna work. Um, and then you're gonna kick yourself for trying to negotiate if this was your only job offer and you absolutely had to have it. So you need to be willing to accept what's gonna happen if this doesn't work. Um, and you need to think about what that is. Do you already have a job? Don't quit before you have another one. You know that, you've heard that. Do you have two job offers you're pursuing and one looks better than the other and if the one doesn't work, you're gonna go for the other? Um, are you gonna go back to school if you don't get a job? I don't know. But you need to be have in your mind, if this doesn't work, this is what's gonna happen because otherwise you look desperate and you do not wanna look desperate. Employers do not hire desperate people, and I'm sure you've already heard that. Even if you are desperate, you don't want to look desperate. You want to look totally in control, right? I see the chat thing pipping, so interrupt me if, if you need to, or I'll move A few on. I'm holding for the end, which I'm letting them know, so we're good. Okay. What is the reservation price? So this is the gap between what you're offered and what you have to have to close this deal in your mind. So let's go back to the 70,000 with my son because we've got this story now. He wants 70. He needs 65 to go on vacation. He's already calculated this and he had. He needed 65 to go on the vacations he wanted, buy the new car he wanted and live in the apartment he'd already found. So in his mind, he has to have 65. They come in at 60. The gap that $5,000 is the reservation price. It's not the difference between what he originally asked for, which is the next thing, your aspiration, and, and what they offer. It's what you gotta have and what they offer, and you need to know that. Maybe you don't have a reservation price, or maybe you need it because your spouse lost their job, or your spouse wants to stay home and start up his own company, or you have two kids that are twins that you need to send to college. I don't know what it is, but what is the must have price or you're not gonna close this deal? You need to know what that is. And then when you start negotiating, you need to know what they're, they're offering you because that's the gap you need to close. My son did not need to close the gap between 70 and 60. He needed to close the gap between 65 and 60. He ends up with like 68 with that bonuses they're giving him. So he's super happy. He almost got to his aspiration in this, but you've gotta know what those two things are. 
so that you know if you're going to make this deal work or not. Okay. And then the last thing is what's your aspiration? For my son, it was 70. And your aspiration is I would be so happy if I could get this. That's what you're going to ask for, right? You don't ask for 62, you ask for 70. Um, and I'll tell you my story on the aspiration. I, I tend to drive my cars for 10 years. I drove this car for 10 years. I was always buying the same brand. I went back to get another one, a new one, and I couldn't get what I wanted. And so I thought, I'm going to look around. But by then, I had already negotiated the price for that brand, the new car. So I go to a different, different company completely, go to the dealership. And I found one I wanted that was even better than the one I had negotiated. So I told him, um, here's what I'm willing to pay. And he goes, whoa, that's like way lower. We're 5,000 apart. I said, yeah, I get it. But I could have gotten this car at the other dealership, not the dealership, but the other brand. Um, I'd rather have yours, but I'll go back and get that one if I need to, which wasn't true. I would have paid, but I thought, let's try this. Well, he did it. He gave it to me for that price. And I went like, Yahoo. I went home, told my husband we're going out to dinner. I was super happy. I'm still driving that car today. And every time I get in and I'm like, super happy. I got this for my aspiration price. Doesn't hurt to ask. Sometimes you get it. Sometimes you don't. Right. Uh, but you, so, so basically three things you need to think about even before you go into, if this doesn't work, what am I going to do and be comfortable with that? This is the price I have to have to make this thing work for me. And you need to know that in your head. And then what's your aspiration? What would I like to have? And that's what you're going to go in asking for. So before I go on, any questions about any of that or comments? Okay. So. Oh, wait, Bonnie. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so. How do you negotiate when the employer tells you up front before inter interviewing what the range is? How would you, if they give you a range, how, are, how would you do this practice with the range? I'll talk in a minute about understanding the job market and all that stuff. I okay. would always go a little bit higher than the high end of the range if you think you're worth it. Because yeah. again, even in the range, there's more money there that they haven't told you about. So go high. There's nothing to lose. Matter of fact, if they're willing to tell you the range, you know where you are. It's beautiful. They've already told you the top end of the range they're willing to pay you. So then go negotiate from there, right? And silly them for even telling you there's a range. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Um, no, I think you're gonna cover, I'm gonna hold some of these until the end. Yeah. I think, yeah, okay. So now we get into the tactics. So we've talked all the why, now we're gonna talk a little bit of the how, right? And what is negotiation and all that. Now we're gonna start on the how. The first thing you need to do is assess the situation. This is critically important because this gives you the confidence to know that this is what I'm gonna go in and ask, right? And there's three kinds of situations. There's kind of the you situation. You have to know how much you're worth. It's really easy today because there's Glassdoor and there's Indeed and there's Google and there's all these things that they didn't used to have when I was negotiating, even LinkedIn, right? Assess where you fit with all of those things. If you've got 20 years of experience in a field, you definitely should be at the top end. If you're just coming out of college, you're not gonna be at the top end, but what the heck, go for the mid-range. That's what I tell my kids. If they do, you know, if you looked on Glassdoor, they'll tell you starting, ending, mid-range. I tell them, go for the mid-range. Why not? You've got a college degree. You've got co-op experience. Ask. All they can do is say no. So if you've been in the industry for a while, I would look at the top end of that industry and say, this is where we're going to go target. But you need to understand, don't go in asking $200,000 if this is a $50,000 a year job, right? So you need to have some idea of, of what's going on out there for this particular job. The second thing on assessing the situation is the industry. Where is this industry right now, right? If I'm a truck driver, I can name my price right now today. I can get a thousand dollar sign on bonus. I can get stay bonuses after 30 and, and 60 and 90 days. And I can get a lot more money than I could get last year. I know that because I'm trying to hire truck drivers. It's a nightmare. So that's good. If you're a marketer right now, it's probably a nightmare because everybody's at home, nobody's shopping. So you need to understand your industry and where it is right now. 
this kind of stuff you can go look on Google for, right? And just search, 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 spend a couple hours one day searching your industry and see what the situation is out there. So there's you, there's the market, and then there's your company. So if you have a job offer or not an offer, but an interview, and that you think you're going to get a job offer with a publicly traded company, piece of cake, you go online, you look up their last annual report that tells you pretty much everything you need to know. If they're not publicly traded, Castellini wasn't, it's a little harder. You don't know how much money the company's making. You don't know their trends or anything. So that's where you got to get a little sleuthy. If you have any friends that work for this company, take them out to lunch and find out how the company's doing. Tell them you're interviewing and what kinds of things would they be interviewing me for? Why, why are they hiring for this position? What's going on? Are they expanding? Are they contracting? Are they getting into a new market? You need to know that stuff. Go on Google again. I love Google. Look up that company's name and see if they've been in the news for anything, right? Disney just announced a 32,000 or whatever person layoff yesterday. You, you probably aren't going to want to go interview with Disney right now. It's not a good time. So understand yourself and where you are in the market, hopefully mid to top end. And that's your choice, how you position yourself. Understand the industry and what's going on and understand the company. So let me go back to marketing and just use that as an example. I've never been in marketing, but I've worked with lots of marketing people. Um, that has a huge range. If you are in consumer products marketing, you're going to make over $100,000. Because if you think about it, consumer products are things you need to buy all the time. Cheerios. Every three or four weeks, you're back buying more Cheerios or not. It's a really big aisle if you've ever been down it in the supermarket. So the marketers are trying to either get you to keep buying Cheerios or try this new stuff. And if a marketer does a good job, the company does well. It's super important. So if you're in consumer products, marketing is a great field to be in. If you're in entertainment, it's awful. I mean, entertainment, 35 to 50,000. Why is that? Well, we own the Reds and I know we hardly pay anybody anything at the Reds. We get away with it because everybody wants to work for the Reds because it's sexy. So I'm paying more for the same job in a trucking company than I am in the Reds. So you need to also understand from an industry standpoint, if you are looking and it's more important for you to be in an industry like the Reds or entertainment, go for it. If it's more important for you to make as much money as you can, understand this is trucking. It isn't sexy, right? You can't have both. So doing a little bit of homework on just the market is also good. So that's kind of um, the aspirational piece or assessing piece, sorry. The next thing is you need to personally prepare. So now that you understand what the situation is, and I'm sure you heard about this in the interviewing training, but I'll reiterate it because it's important if you're gonna negotiate as well. You've gotta do your homework. You have to think about how you are going to show up confident and be confident because again if you look desperate this is what i do i've interviewed a few people and i say why are you interviewing with us and they've literally used the word desperate i've been out of work since may because of COVID. i'm desperate to get a job click click we're done because you're only taking my job because you're desperate and you're going to leave again as soon as the industry gets better or whatever i don't want any desperate people here so uh, i keep harping on this but it's really important you need to do what you can to know that you have an alternative and that, that you're not desperate for this job. So prepare yourself um, and prepare on how to sell yourself to get this job. Understand what this company is going through right now. Um, and again, if they're consolidating and they're hiring, that's interesting because they probably have too many people. So why are they hiring? They need a particular skill set they don't have. And clearly I've got it. So let's sell that skill set to them, right? If they're growing like crazy, you need to come in and, and sell yourself as, as a growth agent. So, you know, preparing, I think, is really important. Um, I recently interviewed uh, someone for a logistics job. So this was like three weeks ago. He was coming out of Georgia Tech. Um, we're in produce, right? So if you buy berries and you don't sell them in five days, you're literally dumping them. So this is very fast moving. And this guy had had a co-op with Lockheed, which is an airplane manufacturer. So in the interview, I said, wow, you're like at the opposite end of the supply chain from me. And he said, why? So I share the Barry story. And I said, you know, I know airplanes, it's years long contracts. It takes years to build them. 
So it's just on a much slower pace. Because I'm trying to figure out, can this guy operate at the speed I'm going to need? And he says, I beg to differ from you, with you. And, I, and I'm like, okay, this is a college graduate arguing with the recruiter. I'm like, okay, cool, why? He said, when we're making an airplane, sometimes something happens in our supply chain and we run out of parts. So he said, we can be making like five airplanes on an, a huge assembly line and we don't get the part in. And now I've got five half-made airplanes that I need to go find a place to store get them off the line, store them, and bring in another airplane, accelerate those parts until I get this part back in and then fit this one back into the schedule. And I thought, holy cow, that's like so much more complex than anything we've done. That story has him today, literally today, interviewing in the plant to get the job. If he hadn't told me that story, I would have not been able to translate this. So this is prepare, be able to translate what you've done, however you need to, into what we need. Because now I'm excited. You're bringing something to the party I need. The next one is the engagement with, with your counterpart. The more you can figure out about the person that's interviewing you, the better. So this is where you call in all your friends, right? Anybody you know that works for that company, look stuff up about them understand what kind of an interview you're going to have and and how how to engage with them on this negotiation and again i'm sure i'm repeating stuff that you already heard but i think it's probably it's probably good to to hear it this is where practice comes in if you walk into an interview a little bit concerned about this negotiation and we all are so i mean nobody's going to be that confident it's good to practice all the things they might say to you out loud and get somebody to do this with you. Think about all the things they're going to say. You're way out of our price range. Um, we've got two other candidates that we're looking at as well. Um, that's way more money than we were expecting. Um, whatever. Think about all the things they might say and know what you're going to say back and practice it out loud. Because when you get in there and they do it, and you say back what you've already practiced, your confidence will go way up. There's been a study, and I forget who did it, I think it might have been Malcolm Gladwell, that said it takes 10,000 hours of practice to be good at anything. Some of you may have heard this, whether you're a violinist or a baseball player, or a writer, anything. You need 10,000 hours of practice. You probably don't have 10,000 hours of practice negotiating. A professional negotiator does, you don't. But the more you can practice before you get in there, the better right? So this is probably the biggest thing I would say as, as you go to engage with your counterpart. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, and I've talked about this before, there's two poses if you can practice them, give you confidence before you actually get in there, which is the rocky pose and the winning pose. So the winning pose, you can see me, I guess you can see me, it looks like this, right? And, and they've done studies on this pose and it does things in your brain that are good things when you're going into a negotiation. Monkeys do this pose when they've won something. So this is inherent in our brains. Blind people do this. If you, if you watch the um, Special Olympics where there's blind people and they win, they do this. So this is not something we've been taught. It's in our brain, in, in a prehistoric part of our brain. And when you do this, you feel confident and, and happy. So my recommendation, and I've told my kids this too, before you go in there, you go in the bathroom and you do this for a minute and you breathe deeply where nobody can see you and it just calms your brain down, right? So, so I would definitely do that as well as part of this engagement thing before you actually engage. Um, and then the last thing is package the ask. So I'm gonna ask a question again to go in the chat room. And you've mentioned some of these. I'd like to hear some more creative ones because I've heard a couple. Besides salary, what else could you ask for? So we got PTO, which was mentioned before, um, or, or time off that may be you need for your family. Yep. Um, yeah. A lot of uh, uh, paid for, pay for training and certification. Yes. Which yes, that's here. a good one. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, leave time, flexible hours, flexible schedule. Uh, contributions to the your HSA or your yep. your your um four hundred one k. Yep. Um, remote work, uh, job placement. Maybe there's a particular assignment that you'd like. Yep. Um, yeah. Perfect. Good answer. So there, yes, and there's some things that are going to cost your employer money. Four hundred k, four hundred one k, retirement salary bonus. There's other that things. Is, sorry, mm -hmm. here's a really good one. I uh, time to volunteer. Yes, perfect, perfect. These are great because some people, these things are important, right? Uh, my yeah. husband, I've always had more vacation than my husband. And so he always goes in and negotiates time off without pay every job because we've moved around a lot and he has to keep starting on a new job. He always negotiates time off without pay and he always gets it because that's a showstopper for him. He needs as much vacation as I have. If they're not willing to pay it, that's fine. I need this. There are financial, remember I talked about the pie, right? There are some things that they're not going to give you more total than they intended to give you. But a lot of these things you mentioned won't cost them anything, right? Those are easy to give. And if they're important to you, absolutely ask. So here's a couple things on this one. Don't let them negotiate one item at a time with you. That's what they're going to try to do. Because once they get the salary fixed and you've agreed to 60000 now let's start talking about these other things. The salary's off the table. You don't get to negotiate that anymore. And they can knock you down item by item. You don't want that. So don't agree to anything until you've agreed to everything. Um, and again, th this can be tricky. I don't know if you're doing this by email or on Zoom or in person, but you know, if, if they insist that all they're gonna give you is 60,000, then you come back with words like, and I'll tell you my story. I won't even tell you this. I'll tell you what happened in the job I'm in now because I think it's a perfect example of this negotiation thing. So I retired from P&G. I had six weeks out, uh, vacation. I didn't need to work, but I really wanted this job. This is a small produce company. So compared to what I was making, no stock options. The healthcare was, was not as good. Um, the, the retirement was not as good. The salary was definitely not as good. And I was willing to take all of that, but I needed six weeks of vacation. So we start on the negotiation. And in my mind, I've already said, yep, I'll take your salary. I'll take your health care. I don't care. I'll go get it with my husband, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to hold out for the six weeks. So you sort of need to know what you're going to walk away for. I would have walked away if I didn't get six weeks. And so we start, in my mind, again, I'm okay with this. I'm okay. I haven't told him any of that. We're still talking everything. And I finally said, Brian, the vacation's a showstopper. You're offering me three weeks. I've had six weeks for the past 15 years. I got to have six weeks. And he said, Bonnie, you need to understand nobody here has more than three weeks, including me. I said, I fully understand that. And you need to understand I'm not coming if I don't get six weeks. Because that's where I was. I had talked to my husband about it. I said, I'm not doing it. Even for five weeks, I'm not doing it. So that was kind of my reservation price, if you will. So we went back and forth for a couple of months on this. And I was in Canada on vacation and he called me in the hotel room and said, okay, I've talked to Bob Castellini. Um, we're gonna give you five weeks. And I thought to myself, silence is your friend. So I counted 1,001, 1,002. I didn't say anything. Of course, he can't see me. I'm at the other end of the phone. And he goes, and you get five sick days. So we'll just round that up to six. I said, okay, you got a deal. So he knew that I wasn't coming for less than six weeks. I knew he really wanted me and he did at that point. And I held out. Now, I gave up everything else because it's a package. And at that point, I told him, I'm going to take this, 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 and this. And unless you give me six weeks, I got to walk. So that's a negotiation. And again, don't let them negotiate you one item at a time. It's a package. And you need to try, if you really want the job, do like my son did, where they came back and said, we'll give it to you in bonuses, right? Or I need you to, pay, I'm halfway through an MBA program. I need you to pay for the rest of it. I need one day off a month to go volunteer. I don't know what it is. But understand that some of these things financially, they're not going to budge total. So you may have to trade off one from the other and understand these other things can get you to the win-win because they're not going to cost them anything. 
Okay? Good. So, BATNA. This is a term that every negotiator knows, and it would be good if you knew it too. It's called the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. This is a negotiating term. So if you're in a hostage situation, they'll talk about BATNA, right? We're trying to get the guy out. We're trying to keep everybody alive. What's the best alternative? Get the sharpshooters and be ready to kill the guy if you have to, to get them out. It's not what we want, but we're, but we're gonna, you know, this is a horrible example, but I mean, this is, this is what BATNA is. What are we gonna, you know, Brexit, I'm sure they're talking that right now with Northern Ireland. What are we gonna do if this doesn't work, the clock is ticking. So um, you, you need to understand BATNA. The premise of it is, what are you gonna do if it doesn't work? Um, and, and this is where you need to know what it is. So I'll give you a couple of examples, not job examples. If you've gone to a used car lot or a new car lot and fallen in love with the car and that's all over your face, the salesman knows it. And he's hoping you don't have a bad enough, that you're gonna pay whatever he'll sell that car to you for. And a lot of people do, right? You've seen movies, I'm sure, at the auction house where people keep auctioning up higher and higher than they ever intended to pay and then they're stuck with this painting that they paid five times as much for and have to sell their house to get it. They didn't have a banner. You have to know when you're ready to walk away and what's the best alternative to that. Because if you go into the job and you want, and you say in your mind, okay, my spouse is gonna quit his job, I gotta have 65, you fall in love with the job, they offer you 35, and you're tempted to take it, you need to understand the alternative to that. If I take this 35,000 job, he can't quit his job, or I'm gonna walk away from this even though I love this job and I'm willing to keep looking. But that has to be in your head. What am I gonna do if this negotiated agreement doesn't work? And know that before you ever go in there to negotiate. Because if you don't have that, then you are desperate because you have no other alternative, okay? Um, by the way, Castellini's BATNA wasn't good. That's why I got the six weeks. All right, so a few more thoughts on the actual negotiation itself. Active listening, super important. You need, and it, you know, the whole body language thing is hard because we're all on Zoom and you may not be there in person. So all you can see is from here up. You can't see that they're fidgeting or how they're fixing their legs or anything, but you need to actively listen, not just to the words, but to the twitches and the hums and the looking off and try to interpret what all of that is. Because that's telling you whether you're on the right track, whether you're gonna make a deal here or not, which are the sticky issues. Like I started talking 401k to Brian and I was clear that that was a non-starter. We've got a program, everybody gets the same thing. There's no use negotiating that. And you can see that in their body language and it's like, okay, click that one off, let's move on to something else. The second thing is deadlines. We play deadlines with each other, whether they're real or not, right? I need an answer by next Tuesday because I have another candidate. Or I, I need an answer by next Tuesday because I have another job offer. Deadlines can work and they can kind of backfire too. So be careful on the deadlines. If they're real deadlines, you need to tell them. I have another job offer. If I don't have, you know, if we can't make this work by next Tuesday, I'm gonna be forced to take the other job. If that's the truth, you better tell them and let them figure out how to meet your need. If they're playing the deadline game with you and you really need more time, that's negotiable too. So if they tell you we have to have an answer by Tuesday, you can call them back the next day and say, look, I really want this job. I've got a few more things I need to iron out and we need to talk about, I really need till Thursday. They're gonna say yes, they always do. Here's the low offer highball thing. like. They may come in with a very low ball offer just to see if you're going to take it. You may go in with a ridiculously high offer to see if they're going to pay it. This is where you risk, we're too far apart and we're not going to make this work, goodbye. So be careful on your high ball offer and try to assess if they're giving you a low ball offer or if that's really all they're willing to offer. Because if they are, you know, call it quits if it's not going to work for you. Mirroring, and this is a body language thing, and I think you, you probably talked about this with Karen if you were on that other um, session. But, you know, stick your face up here. This is kind of weird. You can see the pores in my nose. Sit back here like this, not so good because I really can't see you. You want to be about assuming this is all on Zoom. 
mirror them, mirror their language, mirror their tone as much as you can. If they're like super hyper and you're super hyper, that's fine. Try to calm down a little bit. But if they're like a super low keyed person, I have to really tone it down because that's not the way I am. So try to mirror them, especially when you're on Zoom and you're trying to figure everything out. They're trying to figure everything out with that. Um, and then anchoring. Try to anchor this whole negotiation around something because they may be negotiating with five people right now, right? And trying to figure out who's the best one. Try to anchor this thing around your uniqueness, right? If you've just come off of two startups and this is a startup, that's what you want to anchor this thing on. Like, I really believe I can come in here and with very little training and lots of teamwork, get this thing done for you. And I really want this to work. I want this job. I'm really excited about this job. But you've got to help me get a little closer here on the salary, right? So anchor what you're talking about, always reminding them why you're the right candidate. Um, questions before I go any further? Nope. Okay. Um, one more thing before I go further. We talked about this a little bit. You want to lead out with your salary range or your salary target. In many states now, it's illegal for me to ask you how much you're making or how much you made on your last job. So I've learned not to do that. Here's what I do instead. So I'm in HR. When somebody comes in, like say for a director job, I'll have them interview five or six people and I'm always the last interview. So they come in here at the end. I ask them how their day went. Do you have any more questions? How are you feeling? Um, blah, 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 open-ended. And then I say, how much money do you want? I've had people in here that were just the epitome of confidence until I asked that question. And then they just look at me like deer in the headlights and they say, ah, uh, and I say, well, I just need to make sure we're in the same ballpark here. Uh, can you give me a range? Uh, you don't want to be that person. So you need to think about how much, now I give them the chance to come ask me first, right? How much money they want. Um, but be prepared for that question. Be prepared to say it at the end of the final interview. If they say, we're going to think on this, I would say, listen, I just want to have one more conversation. I hope this isn't awkward for you, but in my last job, I was making 70,000, um, or in the job I'm currently in, I'm making 70,000. And my thought about this job as we've gone through is this is definitely a step up from what I was doing and brings together the skill set that I have. So I would expect the offer to be more than 70,000. And I just wanted to put that on the table now, because if we're not in the same ballpark, I'd like to talk. You can say that. Um, and, you know, for those of you who don't like to negotiate, it seems pushy, but it throws your expectation out there first. Now, the risk with that, if they were planning to offer you 90, they just went ka-ching. So you could give them a range. But I would, or you could say substantially more than 70,000 and see what they think substantial is, right? So this whole be ready to talk money, you need to be ready to talk money, even if they bring it up first. It would be better if you bring it up first, but if you don't and they bring it up, you better have an answer. Today I'm I, making this. Um, we hmm? do have a question. We are narrowing time. So I just want to let everyone know that feel free to stay on. And, um, you know, what we will wrap up but you know if you have a few more minutes just stay on um nicole has a good question and i think a lot of people this is probably something they you know people don't know really how to handle all the time is what if they do ask your last salary and you are expecting more like how do you handle the what was your last salary question i would here's what i would say i don't think my last salary is relevant because this job is so much bigger than what i've been doing so let me tell you what i want you don't have to tell them. And like I said, in some states, it's illegal to even ask that. They won't know that and don't say it's illegal to ask that. You'll just piss them off. But I would say, I would hesitate for a second and say, you know what? This job isn't like that job. And I, I think I'm worth this. So I'll, it doesn't matter what my last salary is. This is, what I, this is what I want. So let me, yeah, this time has just flown. So I'm going to show you this. And this is a body language question. We're just going to run through these. Here's the question. Would you hire them? Think about it. Her, her, him, him, her, 
her, her. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So there's a couple of people on this page that I wouldn't hire. I don't even need to talk to them. I don't need to see their resume. They have no confidence. I can see that. And you're probably looking at the same people I am. So you can't look like that when you go in there. You got to look like those other people, right? And that's what this was all about. How do you have the confidence to go in there to do that? Prepare your body, breathe, practice, get a good night's sleep. This is not the night you want to be, you know, binge watching Netflix before. You know this, I'm just saying it. Um, and here's the final question. How much are you willing to pay on the one scale to avoid the discomfort of negotiating on the other scale? Because you are paying. If you don't negotiate, you are paying. And how much are you willing to pay to avoid that discomfort versus get in there and practice? So I would give you some homework and then I'll stay if there's questions. This is the thing to think about. You want 10,000 more than they're offering. How do you negotiate that? And I would go practice that with somebody you trust to be the other side and practice and practice and practice until you're comfortable with no matter what they say to you, that you can drive this as far home as you can and then know for a fact that $10,000 wasn't on the table or that I can get 5,000 of it or this is all they're gonna give me and can I negotiate other benefits or do I need to just go somewhere else? So that's it. Yeah, any uh -huh. questions? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, if you have questions, just put them in the chat. Well, and you definitely, um, the ones that were asked earlier were, were handled in, in that. So um, thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, thank you everyone for joining uh, General Electric Credit Union and the Xavier Leadership Center. Thank you for joining us today and throughout the series. Um, we hope you've gained insight on your job search from getting into the right mindset, creating your brand, interviewing, and more. I want to thank General Electric Credit Union for our great partnership and for all they do for the community. We wish you luck in your search, and we hope that you stay in touch. To follow GECU on their social media, go to gecreditunion.org and follow the Xavier Leadership Center at xavierleadershipcenter.com. Thank you so much, Bonnie. This was a, a great wrap up to our series. Thank it was you. fantastic. And thanks everyone for joining us and take care. And good luck. Bye.